It is like... You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. Welcome back to the Army Flashcards Ranger School Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Wiley. We are on a roll here, so we've been steadily chugging through these chapters recently. Now we're on Chapter 11, Urban Operations. As always, check out armyflashcards.com for lots of free resources. Uh, One thing in particular I'd encourage you to check out this week, maybe. Uh, Go on our website, download the uh, free 100-question pre-ranger test we got on there. Test yourself, see how much you've been retaining from these podcasts. And with that, let's begin. Chapter 11, Urban Operations. Today's security environment demands more from leaders than ever before. Leaders not only lead rangers, but also influence other people. They are able to work with other members of the armed services and government agencies. They win the willing cooperation of multinational partners, military and civilian. Urban offensive operations pose great risk to army forces and non-combatants. Yet the military demands self-aware and adaptive leaders who can compel enemies to surrender in war and master the circumstances facing them in stability operations and peace. Victory and success depend on the effectiveness of these leaders' organizations. Developing effective organizations requires hard, realistic, and relevant training. Planning 11-1 Urban operations include decisive action, the continuous, simultaneous combinations of offensive, defensive, and stability or defense support of civil authorities, tasks that may be executed either sequentially or, more likely, simultaneously during an urban operation. For further study, see ADRP 3-0, ATTP 3-06.11, and ATP 3-21.8. 11-2. Urban areas are strategically important. Several factors attract armies to combat in urban areas, such as using the defensive advantages of the urban environment, developing allegiance and support of populace, adapting urban resources for operational or strategic purposes, infrastructure, capabilities, and other resources, drawing the enemy in, playing on areas' symbolic importance, using the area's geographical advantages, dominance of a region, avenue of approach. Task Organization 11-3 Task organizing subordinate units for urban operations depends largely on the nature of the operation. Some units are always part of the task organization to ensure the success of urban operations. Infantry, special operations, civil affairs, aviation, military police, military information support operations, or MISO, military intelligence, and engineers are units required for decisive action in urban operations. Other types of forces such as armor, artillery, and chemical units have essential roles in specific types of urban operations and may apply less to other operations. 11-4. Military forces conduct decisive action within urban areas. Commanders conduct decisive action abroad by executing offensive, defensive, and stability urban operations as part of a joint, interagency, and multinational effort. The situation mandates that one type of operation, offense, defense, stability, or defense support of civil authorities, dominates the urban operation. Commanders often find themselves executing offensive, defensive, and stability operations at the same time. In fact, waiting until all combat operations are concluded before beginning stability operations often results in lost, sometimes irretrievable, opportunities. The dominant type of operation varies between different urban areas, even in the same campaign. Preparation, 11-5. Operating successfully in a complex urban environment requires a thorough understanding of the environment and rigorous, realistic urban operation training. Training should cover every aspect of decisive action, including appropriate tactics, techniques, and procedures related to offense, defense, and stability ops. Training should also replicate the following. The psychological impact of intense, close combat against a well-trained, relentless, and adaptive enemy. The effects of non-combatants, including governmental and non-governmental organizations, and agencies in close proximity to army forces. 
This necessitates an in-depth understanding of culture and its effect on perceptions, an understanding of civil administration and governance, the ability to mediate and negotiate with civilians, including the ability to communicate through an interpreter effectively, the development and use of flexible, effective, and understandable ROE. A complex intelligence environment requiring lower echelon units to collect and forward essential information, two higher echelons for rapid synthesis, and to timely and usable intelligence at all levels of command. The multifaceted urban environment requires a bottom-fed approach to developing intelligence. The communications challenges imposed by the environment, as well as the need to transmit large volumes of information and data, the medical and logistical problems associated with operations in an urban area, including constant threat interdiction against lines of communications and sustainment bases. 11-6. In a complex urban environment, every ranger, regardless of branch or military occupational specialty, is committed and prepared to close with and kill or capture threat forces. Every ranger is prepared to effectively interact with the urban area's non-combatant population and assist in the unit's intelligent collection efforts. 11-7. In urban operations, every ranger is likely to perform advanced rifle marksmanship, including advanced firing positions, short-range marksmanship, and night firing techniques, unassisted and with the use of optics. While not all inclusive and necessarily urban-specific, other critical individual and collective urban operations tasks might include Conduct troop cleaning procedures Operate units crew served weapons Conduct urban reconnaissance and combat patrolling Entering clear buildings and rooms as part of an urban attack or cordon and search operation. Sensitive site exploitation. Utilization of metal detectors. Utilization of military working dogs. Conduct tactical callout. Work with local army, police, or special operations forces. Defend an urban area. Act as a member of a mounted patrol, including specific driver's training. Recover on vehicles. Control civil disturbances. Navigate in an urban area. Prepare for follow-on missions. Identify explosives, bombs, booby traps, materials used, and methods for making and clearing them. Link up with battle space owner. React to contact, ambush, snipers, indirect fire, and IEDs. Set up personnel or vehicle checkpoint or blocking positions around target location. Establish overwatch positions and support by fire positions such as sniper positions. Simultaneous clearing of top and bottom floors of the building. Assign climbing and roof clearing teams for overwatch or sniper support. Teach how to use long-range surveillance, scout, and sniper teams effectively. Secure a disabled vehicle or downed aircraft. Call for direct fire in CAS. Create and employ explosive charges. Handle detainees and enemy prisoners of war. Know how to extract high-value targets. Treat and evacuate casualties. Accurately report information. Understand the society and culture specific to the area of operations. Use basic commands and phrases in the region's dominant language. Conduct tactical questioning. Interact with the media and conduct thorough after-action reviews. Analyzing the urban environment, 11-8. Urban operations often differ from one operation to the next. However, some fundamentals apply to urban operations regardless of the mission, geographical location, or level of command. They are particularly relevant to the urban environment that is dominated by man-made structures and a dense non-combatant population. These fundamentals help to ensure every action taken by a commander conducting urban operations contributes to the desired end state. 11-9. Maintaining close combat is inherent in decisive action urban operations. Close combat in any urban operation is resource intensive, requires properly trained and equipped forces, and has the potential for high casualties. The ability to decisively close with and destroy enemy forces as a combined arms team remains essential. In stability urban operations, a lack of respect and fear of army forces can hinder recovery as much as the ill-advised use of force. All BCT soldiers should be properly equipped and trained to fight in an urban environment. This allows the BCT to deter aggression, compel compliance, morally and physically dominate an enemy and destroy their means to resist, and terminate or transition urban operations on the BCT commander's terms. 11-10 Previous army doctrine inclined towards a systematic linear approach to urban combat. This attrition approach emphasized standoff weapons and firepower. It can result in significant collateral damage, a lengthy operation, and an inconsistency with the political situation and strategic objectives. Enemy forces that defend urban areas want army forces to adopt this approach because of the likely costs and resources. BCT commanders should only consider this approach to urban combat as an exception and justified by unique circumstances. Instead, commanders should seek to achieve precise, intended effects against multiple decisive points that overwhelm an enemy's ability to react effectively. 
Control the essential and minimize collateral damage. 11-11. Rangers need to analyze the urban environment carefully. Things to consider include Mission. No correct task organization to accomplish the mission. Offense, defense, or stability support operations. Enemy. Disposition. Analyze the array of enemy forces in and around the objective, known and suspected, such as known or suspected locations of minefields, obstacles, and strong points. Composition and strength. Analyze the enemy's task organization, troops available, suspected strength, and amount of support from the local civilian population based on intelligence estimates. Is the enemy a conventional or unconventional foe? Morale. Analyze the enemy's current operational status based on friendly intelligence estimates. For example, is the enemy well supplied? Have they recently won against friendly forces or taken many casualties? What is the current weather? Capabilities. Determine what the enemy can employ against friendly forces. For example, what weapon systems do they have? Are they snipers? What about IED or chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and high yield explosives? Threats. Are there artillery, engineer, or air defense assets? Do they have thermal or night vision device capabilities, CAS, or armor threats? Be able to discriminate between threats and non threats, such as suicide vests. Probable course of action. Based on friendly intelligence estimates, determine how the enemy will fight within the AO, in and around the friendly AO. Know the enemy AO tactics, techniques, and procedures, such as tripwires, pressure plate IDs, or snipers. Analyze historical data from attacks where, what, how, and time of day. Terrain, 11-12. Leaders conduct a detailed terrain analysis of each urban setting, considering the types and composition of existing structures. They use Oakoke, political, military, economic, social infrastructure, information, physical environment, and time, PMECPT, and areas, structures, capabilities, organizations, people, and events, ASCOPE, when analyzing terrain in and around the AO. Refer to Chapter 2 for more information. Observation of fields of fire. Always be prepared to conduct urban operations under limited visibility conditions. Cover and concealment. Thoroughly analyze areas inside and on the edge of urban areas. Identify routes to objectives that give assault forces the best possible cover and concealment. Take advantage of limited visibility, which allows forces to move undetected to their final assault or breaching positions. Use overwatch elements and secondary entry teams for security while initial entry or breaching teams move forward. When in the final assault position, forces should move as rapidly as tactically possible to access structures which afford cover and concealment. It is human nature to stick together and seek safety, but try to avoid bunching up at entry points, funnels, walls, or indoors. Maintain a safe but securable distance between teams and squads. This helps ensure that one grenade cannot take out the whole team at once. Learn to properly use obscurance and use tactical patience to take full advantage of these effects. Practice noise and light discipline. Avoid unnecessary voice communications. Learn the proper use of white light and limit contact with surfaces that could draw the enemy's attention. Obstacles, key terrain, and avenues of approach. 11-13. Many man-made and natural obstacles exist on the periphery, as well as within the urban environment. Conduct a detailed reconnaissance of routes and objectives, including subterranean complexes, and consider route adjustments and special equipment needed. Ensure routes are clear, not blocked. Avoid roads that run along and through marketplaces, as these roads can become easily blocked. 11-14. Analyze which buildings, intersections, bridges, landing zones, and pickup zones, airports, and elevated areas provide a tactical advantage to either side. The leader also identifies critical infrastructure within the area of operations, which would provide the enemy with a tactical advantage on the battlefield. These may include, but are not limited to, communication centers, medical facilities, government facilities, and facilities with psychological significance. 11-15 Consider roads, intersections, inland waterways, and subterranean constructions, subways, sewers, and basements. Leaders should classify areas as go, slow go, or no go based on the navigability of the approach. Always have alternate infiltration and exfiltration routes. Keep in mind that a wall can be breached as an emergency exfiltration route. Troops in time, 11-16. Analyze friendly forces using their disposition, composition, strength, morale, capabilities, and so on. Leaders also consider the type and size of the objective to plan effective use of the available troops. 11-17. Operations in an urban environment have a slower pace and tempo. Leaders consider the amount of time required to secure, clear, or seize the urban objective, along with the stress and fatigue rangers will encounter. Additional time is also allowed for area analysis efforts. This may include, but is not limited to, maps, urban plans, and aerial photographs, collect historical data from other units and indigenous forces, 
hydrological data analysis, line of sight surveys, long range surveillance and scout reconnaissance? Is artillery supporting you and someone else at the same time? How long does it take to shift a 155 howitzer and prepare the gun? What is the priority level for getting armor assets? How close is armor to the target? Does their presence compromise the mission? How long will it take them to move to a location? If armor assets are not previously coordinated, how long will it take to get them? How much preparation, survey, and emplacement time of charges do the engineers need? Civilians, 11-18. The National Command Authority establishes the ROE. Commanders at all levels may provide further guidance for dealing with civilians in the AO. Leaders remind subordinates daily of the latest ROE and immediately inform them of any changes. Rangers have the discipline to identify the enemy from non-combatants and ensure civilians understand and follow all directed commands. Note, civilians may not speak English, may be hiding, especially small children, or may be dazed from a breach. Do not give them the means to resist. Rehearse how clearing or search teams react to these variables. Never compromise the safety of the rangers. Consider having the interpreter use a marking system to separate military males from women and children. Have designated dirty and clean rooms and a tactical questioning area. 11-19. The complexity of the urban environment, particularly the human dimension, requires rapid information sharing at all levels to include joint services, multinational partners, and participating governmental and non-governmental agencies. The analysis of the urban information necessary to refine and deepen a commander's understanding of the urban environment and its infrastructure of systems also demands collaborating among the various information sources and consumers. Close Quarters Combat 11-20 Due to the nature of close quarters combat, the counter engagements are very close within 10 meters and very fast. Targets are exposed for only a few seconds. Most of these engagements are won by the side that it hits first and puts the enemy down. It is more important to knock an enemy down as soon as possible than it is to kill them. In order to win a close quarters engagement, Rangers make quick, accurate shots by mere reflex. This is accomplished by reflex fire training. Remember, always fire until the enemy goes down. All reflexive fire training is conducted with the eyes open. Rehearsals 11-21 Similar to the conduct of other military operations, leaders need to designate time for rehearsals. Urban operations require a variety of individual, collective, and special tasks that are not associated with operations on less complex terrain. These tasks require additional rehearsal time for clearing, breaching, obstacle reduction, Kazovac, and support teams. Additionally, time is identified for rehearsals with combined arms elements. 11-22 In a stance, feet are shoulder width apart, toes pointed straight to the front, direction of movement. The firing side foot is slightly staggered to the rear of the non-firing foot. Knees are slightly bent and the upper body leans slightly forward. Shoulders are not rolled or slouched. Weapon is held with a buttstock in the pocket of the shoulder maintaining firm rearward pressure into the shoulder. This allows for more accurate shot placement on multiple targets. The firing side elbow is kept in against the body, and the hand should be forward on the weapon, not on the magazine well. This allows for better control of the weapon. The stance should be modified to ensure the ranger maintains a comfortable boxer stance. 11-23. In a low carry technique, the buttstock of the weapon is placed in the pocket of the shoulder. The barrel is pointed down so the front sight post and day optic are just outside of the ranger's field of vision. The head is always up, identifying targets. This technique is safest and is recommended for use by the clearing team once inside the room. 11-24 For the high carry technique, the buttstock of the weapon is held in the armpit. The barrel is pointed slightly up with the front sight post in the peripheral vision of the individual. To assume the proper firing position, push out on the pistol grip, thrust the weapon forward, and pull the weapon straight back into the pocket of the shoulder. This technique is best suited for the lineup outside the door. Exercise caution with this technique. Always maintain a situational awareness, particularly in a multi-floored building. Note, muzzle awareness is critical to the successful execution of close quarters operations. Rangers never at any time point their weapons at or across the bodies of their fellow rangers. They always avoid exposing the muzzle of their weapons around corners, this is referred to as flagging. 11-25 If a ranger has a malfunction with a weapon during any close quarters combat training, he takes the need to conduct immediate action. Once the malfunction is clear, there is no need to stand up to engage targets immediately. Rangers can save precious seconds by continuing to engage from one knee. Whenever other members of the team see a ranger down, they automatically clear a sector of fire. Before rising to his feet, the ranger warns team members of the movement and only rises after checking the rear to make sure no one is shooting over him and after they acknowledge him. If a malfunction occurs after he is committed to a doorway, 
The ranger enters the room far enough to allow those following him to enter and then moves away from the door. This drill is continually practiced until it is second nature. 11-26 Special consideration is given to the approach of, to a building or a breach point. One trademark of ranger operations is the use of limited visibility conditions. Whenever possible, breaching and entry operations should be executed during hours and conditions of limited visibility. Rangers should always take advantage of all available cover and concealment when approaching breach and entry points. When natural or man-made cover and concealment is not available, rangers should employ obscurance to conceal their approach. Obscurance can also enhance existing cover and concealment sites. Members of the breach and entry team should be numbered for identification, communication, and control purposes. Ranger number one should always be the most experienced and mature member of the team, other than the team leader. Ranger number one is responsible for frontal and entry and breach point security. Ranger number two is directly behind ranger number one in the order of movement and moves through the breach point in the opposite direction from ranger one. Ranger number three simply goes in the opposite direction as ranger two inside the room, at least one meter from the door. Ranger four moves in the opposite direction as ranger three and is responsible for rear security and is normally the last ranger into the room. An additional duty of Ranger 4 is breaching. The team leader is responsible for initiating all voice and physical commands and exercises situational awareness at all times with respect to the task, friendly force, and enemy activity. He is in a position to maintain control of the team. With the possibility of civilians in the buildings or rooms, Rangers may decide to only enter with precision weapons such as M4s, not saws, to avoid civilian casualties. Note: Consider how much firepower each Ranger delivers. Where do you put the saw gunner in the order? Weight firepower against quick, accurate shots. If Ranger number 4 is breaching responsibilities, it should not be the saw gunner, because this would reduce the firepower. 11-27 Consideration is given for actions outside the point of entry. Entry point position and individual weapon positions are important. The clearing team members should stand 1-2-2 feet away from the entry point, ready to enter. They should orient their weapons so that the team provides its own 360-degree security at all times. Team members signal to each other that they are ready at the point of entry. This is best accomplished by sending up a squeeze, or rocking motion. If a tap method is used, an inadvertent bump may be understood as a tap. 11-28 For enter and clear a room, see Battle Drill 07-4-Delta9509 in Chapter 8. Figures 11-1 and 11-2 on page 11-8 and figure 11-3 on page 11-9 depict how rangers clear a room. When locking down the room, control the situation within the room, use clear and concise arm and hand signals, voice commands should be kept to a minimum to reduce the amount of confusion. It prevents the enemy who might be in the next room from discerning what's going on. This enhances the opportunity for surprise and allows the assault force to detect any approaching force. Physically and psychologically dominate the room's inhabitants. Assess the situation in a less hostile situation. It may be better to slow clear instead of dominating the room with brute force. This keeps non-combatants calm and more manageable. Establish security and report status. Do a cursory search of the room to include the ceiling. Identify the dead using reflexive response techniques, eye thump method, or kick to the groin for males. Search the room for PIR while considering your time available on target. Evacuate personnel. Mark the room as clear by using chemical lights, engineer tape, chalk, paint, VS-17 signal panels, and so on. Procedures for marking buildings and rooms. 11-29. Units have long identified a need to mark specific buildings and rooms during urban operations. Sometimes rooms need to be marked as having been cleared or buildings need to be marked as containing friendly forces. Chalk is the most common marking material. It is light and easily obtained but less visible than other markings. Other techniques include spray paint and paintball guns. Refer to ATTP 3-06.11 for more information. Note. Avoid permanently marking buildings and rooms, as this may cause collateral damage and is likely to deteriorate relationships built with local nationals. 11-30. Chemical lights, or chem lights, and scrim-backed pressure-sensitive tapes, 100 mile per hour tape, come in a variety of colors, can be seen easily from a distance, and can be removed when necessary. The colors of the chem lights and 100 mile per hour tape have different meaning. Red, casualty collection point. Green, room clear. Orange, unexploded ordnance. Blue, clean room. Infrared, breach point. End chapter 11. Alright, that's it for this chapter of the Ranger Handbook. Chapter 11, Urban Operations. I hope you enjoyed it. As I said at the beginning of the show, if you get a chance, check out our website, armyflashcards.com. 
and check out that 100 question pre-ranger test we have on there. Uh, definitely a good gauge on how well you know the ranger handbook. And with the conclusion of this chapter, we only have a couple more to go. So good job. You are getting through the ranger handbook and before you know it, we will be done. Next episode will be chapter 12 of the ranger handbook, Waterborne Operations. So until next time, take care.